This will be my third video talking about APIs so far. So if you missed either of the past two, you can find them linked in the description below or from the Discover Technology YouTube page here. In the last two, we talked about why APIs are important and some important considerations to take if you're a business partner working with engineers. While yes, APIs are a technical product built by software engineers, one of the driving purposes of my videos has been to share the engineering perspective to product owners and business partners and vice versa. In this video, I'd like to go even deeper into APIs to discuss how they're designed in the first place and what expectations you should have when you sit down with your engineers to find the technical solution to a problem. Different organizations classify their APIs differently, but in similar ways. Typically, the industry at large classifies all APIs into three categories of private, partner, and public. At Discover, we as thought leaders felt this was a good starting place, but isn't quite descriptive enough when it comes to aligning with business partners and product owners. So we prefer to take a more nuanced breakdown to classify our APIs. Internal ones are exactly as they sound. They're targeted for use within the digital walls of Discover in our case. These often contain sensitive information you wouldn't want leaked outside the company and collaborative development on those APIs remains within the company. Then our external ones are split into three groups on their own. You have partner product, those are meant to be a product for external consumers or partners. Partner B2B, those for direct business to business usage. And Incubator Lab, those for the incubation or experimentation of new ideas to test in the market. I won't go too deeply down the rabbit hole here, but you can think of a partner product API as one where the API provider chooses the specifications and then allows external partners to use them as is. External input or feedback to these APIs tends to be more limited, as the service is typically made as generic as possible for a broad audience of consumers. When you use a public GPS API or a Maps API, you can usually expect it to fall under the classification of Partner Product API. The expectation is that you'll use it as is, and if you wish it did more, you can request that of the original creators, contribute yourself if it's open source, or make your own version of it. As for B2B APIs, these are more bespoke in that their specifications remain a collaborative effort between your API provider and another specific business entity. This allows you to custom cater the design of an API to be used most efficiently by that individual business, as opposed to the as-is partner ones meant for more broad external use. You can think of this as a dedicated expressway for data between two arranged business partners. Since the system is dedicated to that business partner specifically, it's far more collaborative in nature and tends to change to meet the needs of both parties rather frequently. Finally, you have the Incubator API, which you can think of as an experimental sandbox to prove out a concept quickly. It tends to have early buy-in from its consumer, often being developed in line with a single client at the same time, and is not very generic in design. Since it's typically used for proving a concept quickly, it doesn't tend to follow all the best practices of a production-grade API as a trade-off for implementation speed. It's also not meant to be used for a long period of time and should really be replaced by a full partner API in the long term. Incubator APIs tend to be brittle. So now you have an idea of how APIs are grouped or classified, but once you determine your classification, What's next? How can you ensure that you're building something your consumers can, well, consume? And if they do consume and enjoy your content, I mean, maybe they'll respond back by hitting the subscribe button and enabling the bell for notifications of new content in the future. Who knows? While there are multiple different protocols, libraries, and frameworks you can use in the implementation of your API, all of them require some sort of agreement between the API itself and its consumers. And this is where the term specifications or spec comes into play to describe an API's expected usage. You can think of an API spec as a contract that decides what format of information the API expects from the consumer and what the consumer can expect back from the API. 
it illustrates what the format of the data looks like and how it relates and interacts with other adjacent data. When you use your mailbox, the specification or agreement for use of that mailbox is that you'll either take or leave a parcel or envelope in the mailbox. It's a simple enough agreement and it allows you to deduce your use cases and expected outcomes from a trip to the mailbox. Maybe this time you drop off a letter. When you arrive, you find a box inside and take that out before putting the letter in and going on your way. Package in hand, specification followed. If you opened the mailbox and a feral chipmunk flew out and began biting you, this would quickly break the specification and leave you fairly unhappy with your mailbox experience. Likewise, if you filled the mailbox with custard, you'd likely find yourself explaining your non-compliance to the mail carrier soon after. In the first API video, I used the example of a music player's API. With that API, we can likely expect to get back different types of data objects from the API. We can get a song, an album, an artist, a playlist, etc. Each of these objects is different, but they all relate to one another in some meaningful way. The specification tells us that both albums and playlists have songs. It also tells us that albums have artists and that songs too have artists. Armed with that knowledge, you can design lots of different use cases for your system. Without it, you have no idea how anything in the API works and what is what. If you want to ask the API for a specific album, there are specific details you must send to the API for it to serve you that album. Maybe the album name, the artist, a song in the album, something. We know this because the specification tells us this. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, Jeff, obviously playlists contain music and duh, albums have artists. Sure, in this example, I used music terms, which are common. What if the API instead returned bandle wamps, vundles, and crunker snoops? Without a specification, the engineer attempting to use the API would have no idea what the relationships between these objects are or what kind of data they hold. Without a spec, it's just gibberish. How would the engineer know that all ARC Trans Unified 337 objects have 1 to 3 BCD 725 regulated guarantees each, but TRP Arranged Register 882s always have exactly one BCD 725 regulated guarantee, but only if they don't also have a matching FRU 234 Bureau Minder? Mm. So specs are important because they tell us what things are and how they relate to one another. They also clarify how we should format the data in our requests so that we get back not only meaningful data, but in a data format we can read in our consuming system. We expect a letter to come back. We expect album objects to have one or more artist objects linked to them. Sticking to this contract of data format and structure is an absolute necessity as it allows both the developers of the API and the developers of the consumer application to agree upon the expected data format. If the contract isn't held to, the consumer and the API won't be able to communicate back and forth as the data will just be garbage. Setting and agreeing to a proper specification when planning your API is absolutely vital to building an API that consuming developers will not only love using, but also that they'll be expecting. APIs that don't follow their own specifications are frustrating and slow down not only the creative process, but also the trust and execution of building products that rely upon your APIs. Anyone who has supported a legacy API from who knows how long ago that doesn't stick to known specifications feels this pain. Let's go with one more metaphor just to really hit all of this home. In this scenario, you're a bank customer walking up to a publicly available ATM in the US to pull out some funds. You know the process and have clear expectations of the machine. You'll swipe your bank card, type in your PIN, and request 40 bucks. The machine will then dispense two $20 bills to you and log out. That's the contract and expectation of the transaction. Simple, right? It's simple because the procedure for that machine is standardized and expected by you, the consumer. If the machine had asked for your college ID or your shoe size, that would have been bizarre and broken your expectation. If it had dispensed 40 euros instead of US dollars, that too would have broken the expected contract. What if you'd gotten your pin wrong and it still gave you the funds? You'd be concerned. 
APIs follow a similar structure of expectations and have a few popular formats and protocols they follow. I'll likely make a follow-up video on this, but the takeaway here is to make sure your consumer's expectations are known, agreed upon, and provided from your API to your consumers. When the discussion around specifications comes up, don't brush it off. Put your thinking cap on and start ideating on the future of what your API will be expected to do. Now let's recap. The quality of an API is not purely defined by its speed and uptime, but also by its ability to stick to the classification of audience it's targeted at and the contract specifications it aligns to. Because of this, you should always determine your classification and specifications before either writing or commissioning any code for your API. Whether you use your own classifications or ours at Discover, be consistent and communicate your classifications to your consumers. So hopefully this has been insightful and given you a peek behind the curtain on why powerful, well-built APIs are vital to the success of the companies behind them. In a later video, I'd like to go over common patterns for designing APIs using the REST architectural style. But this video's gotten long enough as it is. If you like this content and would like to see more like it, drop me a like or leave me a comment on what topics you'd like to see me cover in the future. I'm Jeff Godwin, and as always, thanks for a moment of your time.